Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And if you've read my book, or if you've listened to episode one of the show, you will know just how important our guest today and his wife are to me personally. I'm talking about Tom Butler. He and his wife, Lisa, wrote the book, There Is No Death and There Are No Dead. And after studying with them back in October 2005, my life was forever changed. Let me tell you a little bit more about Tom. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronics Engineering and has served as a Strategic Planner, Design and Project Engineer in the Communications Industry. But he has also had over 50 years studies into something quite different. With his wife, Lisa, Tom Butler is the Director of Association Trans Communication, A-Trans-C, which was founded by Sarah Estep in 1982 as the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena. He has conducted a number of formal studies intended to establish the objectivity of instrumental trans communication. He has personally authored several books, including his latest, Your Immortal Self. It is with great pleasure and excitement that I get to say, Tom Butler, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. I've got a big smile on my face thinking of when I last <laughs> saw you over 10 years ago. And gosh, how far we've both come. It has been a long journey. But yeah. I'm, I'm most interested in the fact that you really have made some changes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And um, you guys continue to be on the path to um, just finding out some phenomenal things and sharing them in this world of trans communication. Well, let's, let's back up because some people have never read my book or know who you are or anything like that. Can you give us a little bit of the background of you? Because I th believe I read somewhere that even in your teens you were interested in this sort of thing. My first introduction, when I discovered I wasn't going to be the first man on the moon, uh, <laughs> I like to say that I, I, I kept looking at these in the science magazines I read. I kept seeing these uh, thoughts have wings, I think it said, advertisements by the Rosicrucians, and I finally joined them in, in high school. And um, that was my first introduction to formal introduction to the things paranormal. And... It, it's been off and on ever since. And as an engineer, my uh, training is, and also my temperament is to that you you can't ignore uh, influences when you de design a system. You you have to pay attention to every input and output. Otherwise, you know, and, and in some disciplines, you can get somebody killed by ignoring the wrong inputs. And so when we come to the uh, study of things, electronic uh, voice phenomena or the visual forms of it, you've got a whole bunch of different influences that you have to model, and that's right down my alley. So after all these years of study and everything, uh, when Lisa introduced me to the EVP after she read the Sarah Step book, then it all became one big modeling challenge to me. So that, that's kind of where we ended up with in this uh, new book. Now, when you met Lisa back in the day, were either of you uh, into life after death or spiritualism or any of that sort of thing, or did that come after? She, when we met, uh, this is in 82, she was reading Out on the Limb by Shirley MacLaine. Mm. So we were kind of into all that at that time. It, it was kind of interesting. You, we, when you're going through your your professional life, uh, you come and go with your your interests as you pay attention to work. Yeah. And that was the same for us. And when we met, we got married within a couple of weeks, actually. And you know, we, were older, you know, we were we've been around the block a few times by yeah. then. So. We, we 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 got married, and it turns out that we got married just about the day that Sarah Eastup started the uh, a AEVP that we took over in 82. And 
looking back, and we've talked about this in the uh, the No Dead book that we wrote together, that it seems as if we've had free will, but it seems like a lot of our choices have been just exactly leading us toward this. And so we do feel guided. And even in, when I, I wrote this new book, I there were a lot of mornings I woke up with, well, I've got to change that chapter to this, that mm. kind of thought. So it, the guidance... And, we're not unique. I'm not. I'm just really a reporter in this. You, you're finding out yourself that you can learn these uh, abilities, and and they're really something that they're innate in all of us. It's just that we're learning to pay attention, and so we're all guided. Mm. Speaking of the guidance, I still remember when I met you both. I had picked up your book, and uh, had I'd seen somebody at a spiritual church give a demonstration and talk about EVPs. And at that point, I had just taken a mediumship course, and I so wanted more evidence that life after death was real. And I remember buying your book and buying a digital tape recorder and trying to do my first recording. And it dawned on me, Tom, that if somebody started talking, it would scare the heck out of myself. <laughs> so I put it away. I said, there's no way I'm going to play with this. So many months later, I found myself wanting to go on a retreat. And there's a beautiful retreat center in Rhinebeck, New York, called the Omega Center. And and I only had this one week free between my busy life. And um, lo and behold, who's there giving a course? You and Lisa on electronic voice phenomena on that exact week. And that was the only course we've ever given there. Isn't that something? You were there for yeah. me. You were there for me. Um, and I think it rained the entire time we were there. It did, but with those raindrops, I got one of those class A EVPs that you guys talk about. So, Yeah, and you see, you're, you're illustrating the, the fact that you know, when people get these curiosities, these urges and everything, the difference between a seeker and a, and a casual observer is one who acts on those urges. Yeah. So you really did act on your urges. Mm -hmm. But everybody, pay, pay attention to the, the guidance you get because some things keep showing up over and over. <laughs> Follow yeah. it. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about uh, EVP first, or how should we go? Because I, I know there's a lot more about instrumental uh, well, transcommunication. Yeah. But. Let's, let's look at EVP. We... we Worked with it with quite a few people. Uh, we we had one group within our organization we referred to as a big circle, and it was uh, it, it, mostly mothers who had lost loved ones or children to the other side, and they were trying to use EVP to uh, make contact, and and some of them made some very good contact, and um, we were fortunate enough to have three or four. Uh, members who would I'd call would be uh, very confident practitioners. They were able to produce EVP pretty much on demand. And so we were able to conduct some studies with it, and, and through the studies we've pretty well established kind of how it works, what does work and what doesn't work. And about the time that... Um, the the, uh, the big circle was winding down and people were moving on in their life and everything. Um, a, a technique called radio sweep showed, showed up. And it's become kind of a silver bullet and everybody using it. I won't go into the detail of how it is supposed to work, but basically our research on it, our study of it, pretty much convinced us that it doesn't actually produce electronic voice phenomena, phenomena Although the noise it produces sometimes is used for EVP, like what we call transform EVP. So anyway, the bottom line is that we've learned kind of what EVP is and what EVP is not and have uh, used it as kind of a light lab rat to develop um, some pretty good theories of how transcommunication works. Can we back up just a little bit? It just dawned on me that I'm assuming every person listening knows exactly what EVP is. Can you just give a little basic of what actually happens in electronic? Okay, they know what the noises are around them. And it helps to have a little bit, maybe a fan or something in background, a little bit of background noise. 
And it also helps to kind of move the recorder around because you, 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 you cause a little bit of noise. You're not, not the steady state noise of the fan, but just interrupted noise with moving the recorder. And if you let, run the recorder for three or four minutes and then listen back to that very carefully, and you listen to the noise in between your voice. It helps, by the way, to talk, you know, like ask questions. Mm -hmm. And in between your voice, you look for the, in the noise, it might take Lisa and I a half hour to re review a, half, a three minute recording. And you, you will sometimes find sound, the noise that has been transferred, formed into voice like sounds. If you listen carefully in some places, what we'll call a class A, which is a fairly rare class A example, you can clearly hear the pronunciation of, of words, and usually there'll be one or two words, and they'll tend to be garbled toward the end, uh, like Lisa recorded one from her mother. So you could clearly hear that it was a woman, and it sounded like her mother. I was able to recognize the voice without prompting. And it garbles off at the end. So it says, I miss you, Lisa. And the, the, the last part of Lisa's name is garbled. But that's kind of what we we find with EVP. It's not like mediumship where somebody's giving you a message from the other side. In this case, it's just you and that recorder. And sometimes the voice is on it. And anybody should be able to record it, a voice and it just takes some patience, I think, and then a little bit of work listening to it. Yeah, it definitely does. I think it, I always compare it to learning a different language. If you don't know, say, the language French and you hear somebody speak it, it just sounds like noise. But once yeah. you know what you're looking for, it's like, ooh, there's words there. Now, to, to be fair, and we, we think we're pretty sure it's, loved ones on the other side communicating with us. That's our working model. Mm -hmm. But there, and most of the research pretty well supports that, but the parapsychological community, for instance, still looks at it as, uh, well, it's probably delusion is the, is the nicest way I can put it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there, there are alternative theories to what these voices are and we try to maintain a, an objective view of it. So we we really want people, when they work with EVP, first of all, learn to do it themselves rather than get somebody to do it for them. Don't use the some of the ghost boxes and the, you know, some of the modern technology. You just use background noise in a recorder. And... Be open, you know, be open to alternative explanations. Always use, uh, have people help you listen to them in the sense of you ask, you know, a friend, what do you hear in this? Don't say, do you hear my name? Right. Say, what do you hear right. in this? And so in other words, try to maintain an objective view because one of the things what we've learned over the years is it's really easy to delude yourself, to, to fool yourself into thinking something is there that's not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, since I last saw you, I got um, kind of heavy into doing EVP recordings, and then I started sharing them with people because it gave me a backbone for sharing life after death, and that's what I was really passionate about. And, Tom, there were a couple people. There was one lady who had lost her mom uh, in New Orleans. She had passed away in the hurricane, and she never got to say goodbye to her. And I actually met this woman randomly at an airport. And just before we boarded the airplane, I ended up, because uh, she was grieving so bad, I had the courage to tell her about EVPs. And she says, oh, do you think we could try to record? And I'm thinking, gosh, it's 15 minutes before the flight departs. We're in a noisy <laughs> airport. You know, I really don't know what I'm doing, but I said, you know what, we can try. And this woman introduced herself as D. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe the background noise is all the airport stuff. And so not really knowing what I'm doing, I we sat and I recorded for about a minute. And then I did what you showed me to do. I put it in my computer and tried to loop it. But right in the very beginning, it says, I love you, Elizabeth. Now, you got to know, her name to me is D. Come to find out yeah. her, her birth name is Elizabeth. And only her mother called her Elizabeth. 
Well, so, good catch. Yeah, and I've had several of those kind of things. So for me, I tend to believe it's our loved ones. Yeah, that's our, when you, when you can sometimes recognize the voice and things that's exactly true. For for your for your listeners, one of the things is on the website atranc.org, A-T-R-A-N-C dot org. We have a, a white paper uh, that is, it's fairly lengthy, but it has the background of EVP. It has uh, techniques and how to record a little bit about what is and isn't and how to listen to it. So if there's a there's a pretty good how to uh, manual that they can download. Yes. Um, and I just, my mind just flashed to some pictures you have in your new book. There, what do you call the images that, uh, I, I think in your book, your new book, there's images of people and then they had a television screen. The television was turned off and then in the picture that's photographed, oh, yeah. in the background yeah. you see partial faces. Those are officially called faces on turned off television sets. Oh, it's beautiful terminology. <laughs> I don't know how they they they're one of the, the phenomena that we study that just doesn't fit any of the other phenomena. It doesn't fit any of our models whatsoever. But there, there, we have a lot of cases of if if you it, it, there's almost always a child in the picture. And it's a situation, say, you know, like mama's taking a picture of baby doing something. There's a television set in the background and it's turned off. Sometimes there'll be a face on that television set that doesn't belong there. It, it sometimes will be in color. It might be uh, reflected, but, and, you know, it's shaped out of reflected light. But television sets have a, a neutral density uh and photograph shows up as a neutral density with a little bit of optical noise in it, and it turns out to be an. You know. So, um, we're not sure exactly what it is, but it's worthwhile for people to check their pictures, baby pictures, when there's uh, something reflective in the background to see if there isn't a face in it. We'd love to get more examples of that mailed to us. By the way, well, we'll continue to share. But that's another example. Is this what you call? these different things, instrumental trans communications, like they happen. Well, in, in the case of the, 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 the faces on television set, um, it, it, it's more, it, yeah, it, it'd be visual ITC, instrumental okay. trans communication, but, but it's, it's not induced, it's spontaneous. And most of the time we think of ITC as induced, meaning that we cause, we ask a question and get an answer. And uh, when it just, shows up in our pictures, um, a lot of times they'll call it spirit photography. We go back to the old days where the, uh, in spiritualism, they'll have uh, pictures of, well, when you see an apparition in your picture, right. when you photograph, like there's an extra, there's somebody that doesn't belong there. Those are caught, like it's like you're catching a ghost walking through the scene as opposed to deliberately seeking out contact. Because we can literally induce phenomena with EVP and uh, some forms of your ITC, visual ITC. Hmm. What other ways are there that you've induced it besides sound and... Um... Um, well, the common denominator appears to be um, random noise. The, let's go back to the... the, the there's an de electronic device called a random event generator uh, or random um, RRG the random noise generator. Anyway, the uh, Global Consciousness Project, uh, if you look that up in the Internet, uh, I think they, they call the new, new, new Sphere, something like that. They've changed the names. But the Global Consciousness Project is an array of random event generators around the world that are reporting through a, a computer, personal computer, to a central location, and what they're doing is, is they're looking for changes in randomness of the event generator. And you may have heard of it the, the, before the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center. Uh, the, the random event generators showed a uh, increase in order, if you will, mm -hmm. become less random globally, and it was, it's almost 
and this was seconds before the attack, and, and what they think, well, what I'll ter- translate it as for them, is that it was almost as if the, the, our, the humankind was a moment of dread before something occurs like that. So there's this increase in tension. Collective consciousness appears to be showing up as an increase in order in random events. Now we're seeing the same thing in EVP where random noise becomes more orderly and I, I describe it as an intended order. The, it's the impressing intended order on a random process. And that's basically the, the foundation of almost all of the trans etheric influences we see, especially in the instrumental. Wow, good, wow. good stuff. And for our listener too, if you go to we don't die radio dot com and click on episode one hundred and fourteen, um, any link that or something that Tom mentions in this episode, like the Global Consciousness Project. I have links to everything he mentions, just so it's a good home base good. for you to to look and even go right to Tom's websites. Um, so, do, Tom, do you remember the first EVP you heard? Do- yeah. Um, Lisa had been recording for a while. And by the way, she went through the same thing where she read... Sarah's book, thought she'd try it, uh, didn't really, wasn't sure if she wanted to or not. That yeah, kind it's of kind thing. of scary. Uh, did. Some of us yeah. good Christian folks, are we playing with the devil here? You know, like what's going yeah. on? Well, also, you know, both Lisa and I are, are technology oriented and, mm-hmm. and very pragmatic. And EVP is just, well, you know, what idiot would think that's real? You know? Right. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to get your, especially for an engineer. But she finally tried it. And she recorded for a while, got EVP, and she was just fine. But I wasn't able to hear any of them. I, obviously, I wasn't listening into the right part of the noise when she played an example. Finally, she recorded one. Uh, a, a little bird had died. uh in the parking building where she worked and um, she asked on the recording what should I have done and this first EVP I ever heard was this angelic woman's voice saying release and remember Oh! and that was the first one I heard and that's by the way excellent advice for all of us about our transitioned loved ones that's beautiful yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. My first one was right there while you were sleeping. I was recording in at the Omega Center and uh, yeah. convinced I was talking to myself. Hey, my friends, if you're here and this is real, I need you to try to talk really loud and then I'll say good night. <laughs> and then I just let it record for a minute and then I said, okay, good night. And when we were in class with you, you had your fancy schmancy computer and you'd upload the sounds and then we could loop them and listen and (laughs) I didn't have any of that I just had my headphones and uh, I still remember very clearly the goosebumps that shot through my system and I heard good night Sandra in a man's voice and then two women said good night good night and then a deeper man's voice said good night and um, holy cow it it was it was scary exciting you know all of a sudden it's like is do I have no privacy? I mean, there are people all around. And then what what really helped me out is when I went into the classroom the next day with you and Lisa and the other classmates, how much, even though I'm the one who heard it and brought the the audio into class, I mean, the people that were in our group were all grieving the loss of somebody really close to them. And to watch yeah. them shift by hearing this, it's like it is real. Life after death is real. You know, really it takes a while to wrap your head around it, but it, it is especially important, I feel like, to people who, uh, well, they're so you, you, it's close to death when, when they lo- you lose a loved one like that. Yes, but this is, it, this is a great tool. And again, on your website, atranc.org, you have a lot of information and even techniques to learn how to do this, right? Right, and... For for the people who want more objective, want more theory, um, I my own personal website is ethericstudies.org. Ethericstudies.org. Etheric, 
yeah, is one one word dot org, and um, basically what happened with the the book is that it evolved out of a, a series of essays. I used to be an editor with uh, Wikipedia. Oh, I did not know that. Guys. Oh, yeah, I, I, I technically still am. But I was with the early days when the uh, the skeptical editors were getting together and basically defining what fringe was, what paranormal was, what pseudoscience was. Yes. And uh, I was in on all of the arbitrations for those. And basically, one of the th- arguments that they kept hitting me with that I kept just absolutely unable to respond to is they said that you guys don't have a theory for why this stuff is or why it works. And if you look at uh, the, in parapsychology, they have a, a huge amount of interest in, in what they call psi, uh, the, the super psi uh, hypothesis. And basically what that is is that your thoughts are residual energy that when you die, what's out there is a memory of your thoughts. And, and that's available to mediums to hear. So when a medium gives you a message, it's really from the, the etheric memory of your loved one's thoughts. Well, th- when they say, well, the alternative to the survival hypothesis, and that's the, almost the sum total of what they call the survival hypothesis. There's no background theory. There's no discovery of what it really means or anything. So... In the book, it began with what I call the, the trans survival hypothesis to distinguish it from the parapsychological version, and it 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 gives a full model. Basically, it introduces the model that I hope can be used to say, okay, this is at least one hypothesis of how this trans etheric influence works. And so that future generations can possibly evolve that. Mm. And so the rest of the book's really just kind of explaining it. Now we're talking about your new book, Your Immortal Self, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. And Which just came out. Th- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just it's congratulations. Just recent, uh, little by little, is getting known. But one of the things that happened in the uh, Atran C is that while we're working with people with EVP, we kind of went through a phase of technology oriented, you know, where, okay, well, how does this work? What works best? What doesn't work? And we kept going back to this, well, that's really important. That That's neat how that, you know, loved one was helped by this and everything. And, and finally, at the end, the last article, in the, the last news journal that we published in 1915, uh, 20, 2014, I think it was, was an, an article about uh, mindfulness and okay. basically the the evolution of our understanding of of EVP is mindfulness it, it it's it's all about people and it's all about the individual's purpose and there there's not only survival but then this lifetime is just a a, a process that we go through to learn things and you know, what does that mean to the individual? And so the the book became more and more about uh, uh, the mindfulness, uh, uh, what you do now matters forever, that kind of thing. So uh, people would say, well, why don't you stick to EVP? And I said, well, th- this is why EVP matters. <laughs> it's really all about people. You know, I feel the same and just like how i express what i do is really awesome to believe in life after death but death but then then what you know it's like so i feel if you don't have a fear of dying you don't have a fear of living and that it it gives our life kind of perspective that it gives it meaning you know like what you say that's true what we do now matters and and the you know, the purpose, you know, when people wonder about, well, why are they here and everything, um, that every, I just got through writing an essay about Hermes' concept. You know, and in, in the, the ancient wisdom schools, one of the common denominators is what they refer to as the great work. And that's the transmuting of the coarse personality or the immature personality into the 
spiritually mature personality. And in spiritualism, they, they refer to that in terms of natural law, coming to understand natural law and living in accordance therewith is the rest of the story. And so our purpose in a very large respect is to come to understand the actual nature of reality rather than how we've been taught it looks. And so what we find out is that, and, and this is this is an important message to everybody, is that the current emerging understanding of how we think is that we are aware of what we have been taught to think of things. In other words, our personal reality is what has been shaped by our community. It's in our worldview database, if you will. And so part of our task in this lifetime, and what I refer to as mindful living or mindfulness, is to align our worldview with the actual nature of reality that and thereby see reality as it is rather than as we've been taught. Hmm. And that's a, that's a lifetime process it's a, it while is. we're living our life. Yeah, exactly. That's really good words. You know, I read somewhere that you have a motto, believe what you wish, but know the implications of what you believe. Yeah. That's a yeah. favorite motto of yours. Can you just explain that's, what you mean by that? Well, it's... I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about paranormal things, and and there's in one sentence they will say something that's belief based, and one thing objective based, and they think that they're both the same. It's it's not that they're being silly or uninformed. Really, is they aren't thinking about what they're saying, and if if you think about I mean, I'm not going to tell you to believe anything in particular, but whatever you do believe, if you just examine the implications of it, and in the, in the book, I, I okay, I wrote the survival hypothesis, and then the rest of it is really what I refer to as the implicit cosmology. A cosmology is a, kind of a, like a, a, a blueprint of reality, and the implicit part of it is that if the survival is real, if it's true, then this necessarily follows as I understand it. So when you believe something, what follows from that? Do you believe that too? Right. Do you accept it? So anyway, that, so it's just mainly just a way of saying, okay, be objective, know what you believe. Ah, simple, easy. <laughs> you yeah. know, my mind just went to, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but way back when, when that movie, that scary movie, White Noise, came out, <laughs> you and Lisa yeah. helped, I don't remember which Hollywood st studio. Market. Universal. Yeah, but you gave them some information about what EVPs were and all that, right? After it was written. No, it, it, we oh. we came in. They, as a matter of fact, they re were reluctant to show us the movie until we were almost through with them. Mm -hmm. um, they 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 basically we went in down there and, and talked to them at their studio and and their executives said, "Look, um, either you're going to help us market this book and tell people what EVP really is, or we're going to get somebody else to do it." And the first thing that flashed through my, our mind was all these ghost hunters and yes. you know, the, the stuff you see on television. So we said, okay, we'll do it. And um, so we, we helped the market. They wanted to make EVP as much of a household term as UFOs and crop circles were, mm -hmm. was at the time. They did that. Yes, they did. And in the process, I mean, like we, our, the first day that the, 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 show, the movie came out, uh, they were mirroring our website for us, and, and our site alone just had something like 70,000 hits in one day. Wow. Uh, it was just amazing, because right now we only average about 700 hits a day. But uh, that, you know, that basically, you know, now it, everybody pretty much knows what EVP is, and there's a ghost hunter club in every town, or at least yes, there like is. 10 or 12 of them, and they all use EVP. Uh, the, the problem is, is that it's there's been a drift in 
what's actually EVP and what they are able to produce. You know, they see stuff on television anyway. I don't want to get into that. If they want to believe it, that's, that well, goes back to my mom. I, I feel the same well. way. It, you know, even when I started sharing that I was recording it, you know, that if, if somebody's never seen the movie White Noise, I'm not going to recommend it. it. You know, if you like scary movies, have at it. Um, yeah, but, the, the bonus features on the DVD I yeah. have us in them. Oh, that's a reason good. to get it. Absolutely. But I, you know, yeah. I... As much life after death stuff as I've explored, I hate scary movies. I just, you know, like I can handle yeah, I some me. weird stuff. It's not a very but, good movie. No, actually. no. But what I think it did was it it let people know it had people start discovering for themselves, and so a whole bunch of people found you and Lisa, and at the time AAEVP and and all that, and so a whole bunch of people I think got introduced to something more than scary stuff and i have ne you know i think a lot of the scary stuff and all the ghosts that's that's for marketing television shows i don't yeah. personally buy into that and anything i've ever gotten are messages of love and some funny stuff you know so i <laughs> well for the for, for the first time in history you know okay evp was officially discovered in 1959 Really? For the first time, yeah, not very long. Well, technology, it's, yeah. it's kept pace with technology. And so the first time in history, uh, uh, I think last year it came out, there's a new handbook of uh, parapsychology that was um, uh, a par parapsychologist who was a member of the association was invited to write a, a chapter on EVP, and he asked me to help him on it. And so the first time ever the parapsychological organization has literature out there, official almost, almost official literature that includes EVP. Prior to that, and still most of your parapsychologists, uh, either they don't have any clue what it is really or they just ignore it entirely. They probably don't. As a matter of fact, one of the leading parapsychologist just wrote a, a the uh, Society for Psychical Research has a new encyclopedia online and they have an article on uh, uh, something about survival phenomena. Anyway, this parapsychologist uh, wrote, included EVP ITC in it. Hmm. But what's funny, he, he's pretty much anti-survival where it's that's become clear in his writing and it looked like he quoted it right out of the evp part of it right out of the wikipedia's article oh. which is just bias so negative and it's also about 15 years out of date so it, it's parapsychology still has a long ways to go before they're ready for any of the work we're doing mm -hmm. but i'm happy to report there's a ton of us doing work for the positive and um, a whole heck of a exactly. lot of lives have changed I think because of it. Let's talk a little bit more about your book, um, Your Immortal Self. You have it broken into three parts and it's a pretty complex book with lots of meaty pieces but would you describe maybe what um, you know the three parts that you okay. have in it? The, the, the first part is really all about the, the model the, the survival model, and, and I've broken it out. I, I've used some, within the context of the book, the glossary of terms will help you, that's in the back, will help you understand it all. If you step out of that context and look at somebody else's theory, they're going to be different terms. So it's really, the book is, is a kind of a self-contained universe in the terms of describing this phenomenon mm -hmm. and the, the, the first part is about the theory the second part is about the community in which we experience the phenomena and then that's basically anybody who is interested in in things paranormal and, and here I'm not talking about UFOs or crop circles or anything I'm talking about things having to do with uh, psychic functioning uh, mediumship, um, energy healing, that kind of thing. Uh, and people were, uh, so you have, uh, 
hauntings investigation people, you have seekers, you have people uh, grieving a loss of a loved one, mm-hmm. and you have investigators. And so basically that community is what I discuss in, in Section 2. And and to, to give you a warning on it, on the, the science chapter, I begin with something to the effect of hands down, the worst thing that ever happened to the paranormalist community is science. And I think that it, it has acted as a hindrance to growth for us. So that's kind of the attitude I use in that. Mm-hmm. The, the second, the third section is about the phenomena. And I've tried to, all, all three sections, any subject is treated in terms of the model. So again, it's the world according to the model. Um, and but it, there is a lot of I think very useful background information about the, the phenomena, including what I think is a novel approach on the what I call is healing intention is what I refer to it as rather than spirit healing or energy healing or anything like that. You, you, you have the it's all about intention. The one influence we have on our unconscious mind is intention, and so it's a healing intention rather than. Anyway, can you give an example about that? I think intention's a good thing. For years, I've heard people say, "Oh, it's your intention." I'm like, "What are you talking about? What do you mean, my intention?" Can you just talk a little bit about that and maybe what healing intention is? Okay, there's. If you think about the creative process, you know, in other words, how do we? The creative process is basically the the attention on an imagined outcome with the intention of making it so. If, if you look at it in a model sense, of th- that's the process. And if, if you don't have the intention, then it's just a fantasy. You know, you can imagine something if you're just imagining something, but you don't have the intention to make it so. Then it's just a, a fantasy. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it becomes, and if you intend it to be so, then it becomes an influence on reality. In other words, you, there, there's one really important uh, model a theory out there that uh, is, is referred to as first sight theory and uh, it's uh, James Carpenter uh, wrote it he's uh, very uh, he used to be president of, I think it was the Parapsychological Association anyway it, it, it's based on meta-analysis of all the research done on psychic functioning and he, he's pretty well defined what is emerging as and understanding that we unconsciously, well, okay, we, we get a, uh, it, it say something happens in our environment, and we unconsciously sense it first. If it's of interest to it, then we begin to react to it. For instance, if it's a danger signal, we might start getting adrenaline rush before we become conscious of the fact that it even occurred. Uh, so we psychically, everything in the reality has a psychic signature, a psychic signature. Hmm. And uh, we sense all of it, it's just that we ignore most of it. At the same time, every thought we have produces a psychokinetic signal back out into the environment. And so, in an easy case, for instance, I'm going to reach for this glass of water. As I reach for it, I'm already telekinetically or psychic, psychokinetically sending a signal out to it that it should come to me. Okay. Um, okay. We all do this. This is a, just a natural part, and that's part of his first sight theory, which I've tried to incorporate in the book quite a bit. And what, what it boils down to is that when we have intention to do something, then that signal then becomes an influence on the environment, you know, like pulling that glass toward me. And, and so... In healing intention, what we're really talking about, okay, the person, when I, I work with the healing chair, a, a society, spiritual society meeting, my sitter, what I'm intending to do is to bring uh, an improved quality of life to the person's body that's in front of me. Mm-hmm. The person is a, a, an etheric personality that's just not really that body. So which am I hearing? I'm not trying to heal the, the etheric person. I'm trying to heal the body. And my intention is to heal it. But at the same time, it, the, the person and the 
body, that, that symbiotic relationship, they have to decide what is best for them. I'm not going to decide that. So my intention is to bring their greatest good for them. It is not a commandment that they have the greatest good. So that's kind of the, within the model, healing intention works better than um, spiritual healing or any of those. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so, uh, like we've read about the power of prayer, and it's there's so much yeah. written that we can influence. And it's amazing to me, even just some of the things I've witnessed, that we can intend them to be so. And I've just recently come from a course and learning about some of this healing, which I think is fascinating. And um, you use the word avatar. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's taken from uh, the the, uh, Sanskrit of the idea of luminous being, but it's basically based on the idea of when a, uh, a spirit comes into the body for for a purpose and mm-hmm. the, uh, the of course it's also taken it's I, I like the fact that that movie avatar came out because it illustrated the, the concept very very well but basically what it boils down to is we are a great personality we're immortal we we exist before and after this lifetime um when our body is born and an aspect of ourselves, our conscious self, becomes entangled with this newborn human, then the human becomes our avatar for this lifetime. Hmm. And and basically we we are taught culturally and by our parents to that when we look out of the eyes of our human that we're the human. Right. And but in reality that our conscious self is, is, is it's more like a video camera and its relative position to, to where, where your attention is. If your attention moves into your, um, let's say, on an out-of-body experience, okay, your attention moves to that and it's not with your body, but it's still your conscious self. Um, for this lifetime, our conscious self is with this body, but it's only an avatar for it. It's not who we are. And that, uh, part of the task of mindfulness, I think, is coming to understand that there's a difference between a body-centric perspective of reality and a etheric or personality-centric perspective. And if you can learn to change that perspective, then you can learn to change how you relate to your body and your lifetime and your spiritual growth. Yeah, you know, I've I've have this visual um, of my like a lot of people have I've heard of a soul, you know, or your spirit mm-hmm. is inside you, and I like to view it for myself as there's like a fifteen foot tall spiritual Sandra that's huge, and just that works. Yeah, this is my <laughs> my light, my consciousness. Is that's it, and then you know it just happens to represent itself in this thing i call my body or my avatar but i'm really so much bigger and wiser and one of the things i had done years ago is i took a course on remote viewing which is like an esp technique and and it really hit me that i can't just be this body there has to be more to me than this if i'm able to tell what's on somebody's dining room table uh over in australia you know thousands of miles away you know there has to be that, this that is one is of the things. Good test. Yeah, we have to be so much more. And I, I think that just getting that in your head is is a, a major accomplishment. Yeah. You know, the difference between intellectual knowledge and, and understanding. Yeah. And, and these things can support our lives and actually enrich our lives. You know, these are some big theories, but I'm, and I know you're... Th- for this too, people having the best life while we're here on Earth and and growing and learning and and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's important to live the life. It it's is just sure living is the life well. Tom, we're getting close to our time being up pretty soon. Um, what questions haven't I asked you that you're burning to share? Is there something there? Because I know there's so much in your book, there, but yeah, that I think just, that what best thing is that. On the etheric studies.org, they can go to the website there and 
um, there's there's a tab that will take them to the book, <clears throat> um, and there's and I I try to keep that up up to date. Like uh, for the people that have the black and white uh, paperback, uh, I have the color pictures in there for that and everything. And it's it's just it, there's a contact tool on both a a trans C and uh, etheric studies that they can ask questions, and I'm I'm just real happy to uh, discuss them. Also, we have a idea exchange uh it's it's atranc.org backslash form and um it's open to the public they can register um i like them to use the real name and i'm happy to discuss it. there's been some discussion about the book there already uh the, the idea is to just keep keep working at it keep asking questions uh, i'm probably going to spend the rest of my life answering questions like this i'm happy to do it there's not very many resources out there. I don't expect them to pe people to believe what I believe. I expect people to ask questions and understand the implications of their belief. Yeah, that's the best way to live, I think. It, but once you find some of these answers for yourself, you know, you can live a whole different kind of life. Oh my gosh! Um, which makes me think: How do you think hmm, your life? has improved i'll say improved that you believe in this life of after you know life after death and all these things if you were to look back and you had the road to just engineer and then this other road that's taken you meeting lisa and this and everything do you see how this has enriched your life well yeah i, I guess i have one of the things that I, I, I made a discovery a few years back is that I'm not afraid of dying because of what I've learned here. I'm not afraid of dying, but I am afraid of live, leaving, you know, exiting. So I try to make sure I keep my house in order as I go. But also, for me, a huge amount of understanding. I look at things around me. I ex experience my daily living from a little bit more of a sense of understanding of what's going on around me because of the work I've done with this model, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the implicit cosmology actually can give you the tools, whether they're the right model or not, doesn't matter. It's, the tools are useful for just understanding what's going on around you. And for me, that's been huge. That's been a big, satisfying experience. That's great. Implicit cosmology. Yeah, that's that's what comes out of that's the basically the section one of the book. Oh, I'm so proud of you. I really am proud of you. I can't wait to talk to Lisa next. And I know there's going to be somewhere we're going to gather. Time goes on and some big shindig that we're talking life after death and all this. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, you keep going to the to the uh, uh, places where they're having the mediumship and everything. You'd love to run into us there. So yeah, well, I'm sure we we will. Tom, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm excited. I'm really excited. Um, I I know you sent me uh, the PDF file of your book, but I, I downloaded it on Kindle also today because I wanted to see mm -hmm. all the pictures and <laughs> everything. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I get to sink my teeth into it. And for our listener, um, uh, thank you, definitely thank you for taking this hour to listen to the magnificent Tom Butler and me, and I'm not so bad myself, and to invite you also, I know, Tom, I do have a little bit of an ego in this lifetime, but I am playful. Uh, we playful. do. Yeah, we all do. Um, but I invite you to visit Tom's websites, ethericstudies.org and atranc.org. And, as always, this is episode number 114, and you can visit our home base of wedontdieradio.com. And I also invite you, if you feel like it, to click on the Insiders Club, which is right at the top of the website. And I actually let you read a free copy of my book, We Don't Die. It says just the few, first few chapters, but secret, it's the whole thing. And there's an audio called How to Survive Grief there as well. And lastly, if these shows make a difference for you, and I think they do, I ask you to just take the risk 
put out the intention and press share however you listen uh, because you never know which one of your friends or your friend's friends is looking for some answers or has lost a loved one. And I tell you, just listening to one episode or just even getting a connection to uh, Tom Butler and, and his book um, – will make a difference. You just never know. You never know. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And with all my heart, I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is very important. So make it a great day. I thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.